Hey, good morning. Hey, if you're new, I'd also like to welcome you. I'm Charlie, the lead pastor here, and caught us in the very beginning of a new series. We're going to be looking at these um, interactions that Jesus has with different people, and I kind of want you to go into it. This one is really more about Jesus' call on our life, but a lot of these are going to be, we're going to want you to imagine you're the person that Jesus is talking to, but at the same time, a lot of this series is thinking about and talking about the, the kind of impact maybe that God is wanting us to have on other people. So sometimes we're going to be kind of looking at it through the eyes of, man, can I love people the way Jesus loved these people? So we'll kind of go back and forth all throughout this series, but this one is really more about a specific call that, um, that, that God has, I think, on all of our lives. And as I was getting ready for this message, I was thinking about this story in my own life when kind of what I thought and what I realized God really wanted for me kind of switched. And I was thinking about this morning, I've been thinking about planning this story for a while, and I was like, wait a second, this story happened on Super Bowl Sunday. So it's actually almost, a, is it, I guess, a 29-year anniversary, because it's from my freshman year in college. And I told the first part of this story in Connections. And um, if, you've, if you've been to Connections, you've probably heard this story. It's about... Me as a freshman going to this church, really just about to completely and totally punt on my faith, and through the kindness of a woman during the the say hi to your neighbor time, um, she helped me get connected to this guy who was um, a college minister and was going to be leading a Bible study in my dorm the next semester. So he comes up to me, this guy does, and it's in a really awkward, over-the-top youth pastor, college pastor kind of way. It was just kind of how they are, and I was one, and, and I can still be a little over the top myself, so no, no, no judgment, just assessment, right? So he comes up to me, and he says, he introduces himself, tells me who he is, and I'm going to be leading a Bible study in your dorm next semester. Would you be interested in a Bible study? I don't know how you grew up, but there's really only one answer to that question, right? I mean, I'm, I'm not a pagan. I'm not a heathen. Of course I'm interested in your Bible study. Who wouldn't be interested in a study of the Bible? And I'm thinking to myself, leave me alone. I don't want to be in your Bible study. I don't even want to know you. Why are you here? Like, it was just, it was just really odd. But, but he, uh, and, and then I gave him my number. He asked for my number. I gave him my number. And then I, like, it was lots of mistakes were made. And, um, and so then the next semester, he calls me to follow up with me. So I, I, am, I am in my dorm room with my friends, not just on Super Bowl Sunday, but, but during the Super Bowl, this guy calls me, just to make the, the story completely you know, outdated and unrelatable, you know, on a hard line, because that's all we had. Like, we got the hard line. I'm like, hello? And he's like, yeah, this is Steve. Remember we met at church? I'm like, yeah. He's like, I want to talk to you about that Bible study. I'm like, oh, okay. He's like, I'm downstairs in the lobby. Why don't you come meet me? And I'm like, you want to come down? I'm like, I'm thinking, like no. I'm like, my friends are watching the Super Bowl. It was just so uncomfortable. And like and again, this this the latent guilt of pastor type has asked something of me, so I have to go down there. I look at my friends. I'm like, I, I I'll be right back. It's like, where are you going? I'm like, you don't want to know. And um, and so I, like, everything about this conversation is just it's just go. It has nothing. It's not set up to win at all. My attitude, his awkwardness, um, this little small room off the lobby. It was just all weird and uncomfortable. It should have it should have just been. Nothing. But here it is 29 years later, and I can remember almost every detail of this conversation and, and, and this interaction. And it was in this moment that he had this illustration. We were kind of looking at some different passages, and he, and he, and he draws out this illustration where essentially he communicates to me. He's like, the, the thing that you think the Christian life is about is, is not what it's about. You're settling for something less than... Um, what God is really offering. God wants your whole life, and He wants to do something great in your life. And there was this assessment tool, too, and I, tool, and I, I, I said that I was doing way better than I really was, and, and, it, 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 and, I, and I just remember there was just something about this. It just it really hit me. Because, I mean, there's some. Some things that I would have definitely said were true. Like, I, I, I knew that what I was doing wasn't, wasn't working. I, 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 just, I just did. And if you had asked me um, 
if you could have gotten nineteen year old Charlie to to a, to answer the question honestly, what does it mean to be a Christian? I could have given the, I could have given the right answer about what it means to become a Christian. I, I knew that. But what does it mean to to be a Christian? I mean, I th- I think I would have said, well, you're supposed to go to church every week, and and you're not supposed to have sex or drink alcohol, and that's it. Try to be relatively good and go to church. And, and, and there was something about that that I knew that was deeply dissatisfactory. And, and, that was, and, and my solution was I was about to punt on the whole thing. And he lays out this vision for really what my life could be. And so what we're going to look at today is, 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 is kind of a, a similar passage, a similar idea. That there are some of us, I believe, in this room, like 19-year-old Charlie, that are, that are settling for just kind of intro level or just settling for just less than really the life that I believe that God is offering us. And so we're going to look at this story in Matthew chapter 4. And in Matthew chapter 4, we have here Jesus calling, for the fir- calling um, and gathering his disciples. And so in Matthew chapter 4, verse 18... As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat, and their father, and followed him. So we have this really brief interaction, and if we're going to be honest, there's some parts of the story that are a little weird and a little awkward, but I think if we understand a little bit more what's going on here, we can kind of lessen some of that. But essentially, you've got Jesus coming up to these two sets of brothers, and they're fishermen. I'm sure they've been fishermen their whole life. Their, Their dad was a fisherman. They're kind of doing this thing that they do every day. They're out there. Some are already out there casting their nets. Some are getting ready. And Jesus walks up to them with a very simple, a simple idea, a simple command. Will you follow me? And it says that they, they leave everything to go and do that. And Jesus says, if you'll follow me, it says here, I will send you out to fish for people. Probably the best translation is, I will make you into a fisher of people. And it says at once that they, that, that they all left and, and began to follow Jesus. And so there's kind of three parts to this passage. There's kind of th- three things to this really short simple interaction that I think for us, if we're going to stop settling for less than and really step into the fullness of what a life with God can be, there's three parts of this I think that we need to understand. And the first one is this, and it's just the simple command that God gives. He's The simple command that Jesus gives them is to follow me. And so then the command for us is similar, that we need to follow Jesus. Now, the awkward thing about this story, the biggest, the biggest one, especially the way that it was told to me, it was told to me in a way that just really never made sense to me. And, and you probably don't feel the freedom, as I didn't when I was younger, um, to really say out loud this story's kind of weird because you're not supposed to because, you know, it's the Bible and stuff. But, like, what, the way it was always kind of told to me is, like, this random stranger is just kind of walking the beach and goes up, hey, fisherman, why don't you come with me? I'm like, I got nothing else to do. And, they, and like they drop their livelihood. They abandon their dad. Like dad sitting there holding the net. Like what? Where are you? What? And they're like, I don't know. The stranger with the beard, he just said we should follow him. Like, what, what, what else can we do? Like you can fish is what you can do. And like, and like the only way that it made any sense to me is that maybe like in the, like the, like in the fancy medieval paintings where Jesus' head's always glowing. Like if glowing head guy, maybe he comes up to you and asks, like, hey, we've, like, oh, wait, his head's glowing, I don't know what else we can do. But this is not their first interaction. It's the first interaction in the book of Matthew. But if you look at the chronology, look at all the Gospels, they, this is not the first time that they met. In John chapter 1, the end of John chapter 1, we meet a couple of these brothers, and they are following and learning from John the Baptist, who is Jesus' cousin, and his role was essentially to announce that the Messiah, Jesus, is coming. And so they had kind of gotten connected with him, and so they were walking with him, and John the Baptist 
points Jesus out to him. He's like, hey, that's who I've been talking about. That's the Messiah. He's the one that's come to save the world, save the nation, and to save you. You guys should totally go meet him and talk to him. And so they go and they interact with him. Again, they go and get their brothers and are like, hey, look, man, there's this guy. And they're interacting with Jesus and learning about who he is. But at least at this point, in this stage of their relationship, it's simply, you know, they're, they're learning a little bit more about him. They're figuring out who he is. Um, he's teaching them a little bit. But by and large, they're just kind of continuing to live their normal life. And after, I'm sure, a relatively short amount of time, maybe, maybe weeks, we have this story where Jesus comes to them and says, Hey, um, we've been hanging out here for a while. I would like for you now to kind of get to this next level. I'd like for you to leave all this behind, and I want you to follow me. So they've had some experience with Jesus, and they recognize, hey, I I figured out who he is, and I really like him. He's done this great thing in my heart and in my life, and he is asking me to kind of get to this next level in my relationship and my understanding of him. And he's saying, Hey, come follow me. And because of their interaction with him, because of what they've already known about him, um, they make the decision to say yes. And in fact, if you understand kind of the way that first century rabbis, which is kind of you know the equivalent of, say, a Jewish pastor at this time, the way that this worked, this was actually a pretty normal thing where a, a young man would be looking for some sort of teacher, rabbi, mentor. And they would ask them, hey, would you like to follow me and be kind of part of my, this inner group and be this disciple, this, this, this learner from me? And so a lot of the weirdness kind of fades away, if you know a little bit more about the culture, um, and um, that this wasn't their first interaction. But even still, it's a big deal. They, they were fond of Jesus, and they liked him, and they were learning from him. But it was kind of a big deal for him to come and say, hey, w- will you follow me? And so then the question for us, really, is what does it mean for us to follow Jesus? For them, the call to follow Jesus is something a little bit different than it is for us because following Jesus for them was like, was literal. Like it was like literal following. Hey, he was standing there on the beach and they were in the boat. So like, hey, you guys follow me. And he goes, Right, and so Jesus at one town, they're at that town. Hey, we're going to go to this other town. So they go to the Jesus goes to the other town, and they follow Jesus. Right, they they they're they're following him. It is a very literal following that these guys are doing. They are going where he's going. They're doing what he's doing. Wherever it is he's doing it, they're following him. Now, there's some aspects of that that are similar for us, but obviously, the the following for us is going to be a little bit more metaphorical, a little more spiritual than literal walking behind a person and going where he's going. Now, we could spend not just this entire sermon, but really the next four or five weeks of sermons, just really trying to really fully understand what does it mean to follow Jesus. I mean, really, that's why we, we do this every week, right? We, we come to church every week, and you go to the small group every week, and that really is kind of the big picture topic every week. And it's just breaking down different aspects of that. So we really can't, I don't want to oversimplify it, but for the sake of what we're talking about here today, I want to just kind of focus on this one aspect of it. That to follow Jesus for what they were doing, in addition to just kind of following him around, is like, I'm going to listen to his teaching, I'm going to believe his teaching, and, and, and what I learn, I'm going to apply. And that is God's call on your life. That I need to, I need to know, if I'm going to say I'm going to follow Jesus, I need to know what it is he teaches and what he says I'm going to believe. And then once I believe it, I'm going to make the necessary adjustments. Jesus tells me who God is, and I believe that. Jesus tells me who I am, and I believe that. Jesus tells me who I'm supposed to be and what my life is supposed to be about, and I believe that. And then I'm making the necessary adjustments that I need to to my life. Jesus says it, I believe it, and I'm going to make the change. And that is his call for you right now. And in the same way as with the disciples, the same way with me at 19, 
we're all at this place where I feel like that um, we've had some experience with God. We've interacted with Him some. And it's been, it's been positive. But there's something else out there. I mean, for most of us, we've probably had some sort of interaction with Jesus where we ask Him to save us. My sins have overwhelmed me. They've separated me from God. They're destroying me from the inside out. They're breaking down my relationships. God, I need you to save me. Forgive me, which is what Jesus' death and resurrection does for you. And that brings huge life to us. Probably most of us here in this room have asked, asked for Jesus' help. Help me. I'm struggling. I'm hurting. Can you heal me from this? Can you help this relationship? Can you help me make sense of this problem? Can you help direct me in the way that I need to go? We've asked God for help, and He's shown up and given help, and all that's great. He comes in to save you. That's amazing. That is the best decision you can make. He is offering His help. But there's something else beyond just the saving that He does, and Him just helping you with your life. That next thing for us, I need to follow Him. I need to make a decision to say that I'm going to allow Him to tell me what my life is, who I'm supposed to be, and then make the changes. And then verse 19, what He says is, Come follow me, and I will make you a fisher of people. And so, which is kind of a little clever play on words. You guys are fishing for fish. You come follow me, and I'll make you into something different. I'll make you into someone who is not dealing with fish, but is dealing with people. And we'll say it this way. The command is to follow Jesus, but then the promise that Jesus makes is this, is that he will make you into someone who makes a difference. Basically, what he's saying to them is like, hey, you follow me, and then suddenly you're going to be having impact in other people's lives. And here's the thing that I've noticed. I've noticed this in different seasons of my life and different people I've interacted with. I've noticed it here from time to time where I'll get up here and I'm, and I'm, I'm getting real fired up about something. And I'm talking about kind of who you can be and who we can be as a church and how God has called us to do great things in the world. And if you'll just believe and follow Him, you can, you can change the world and you can make a difference where you work and where you live. You can do all these great things for God. All of, it'll be awesome. And I say that and I, and I get this look back that kind of looked like, I'm... Mm, mm, mm. And it's not just that you don't want to do that. It's like you don't really believe it when I say it. It's like, yeah, pr preacher boy, sure, for you. And the, and the people, the missionaries with the cards on the back that we pray for them. But I'm regular. I could never be that, that person. I, I, I'm, just, I'm just ordinary. Well, first century Jewish fishermen... One, they're pretty ordinary. These, these, are not, these are not elite people in their culture. But second, you need to understand, it's not follow me and become a world changer. It says follow me, and then the next thing that happens is a promise that Jesus makes. You follow me, and I will make you into someone who is having impact on the lives of other people. Jesus will do that. You just follow. I'm going to listen and believe and watch what Jesus makes me. What does he say he's going to make? He says he's going to make him a fisher of people, which again is a very clever play on words, a little fun little metaphor that Jesus is using with fishermen. But obviously it's not meant to take taken super literally because it would have been a little weird and, and disgusting and probably illegal to say, hey, what, what, you're going to do to, what you do to fish, we're now going to do to people. Right? You, you're going you're gonna to catch them, you're going to kill them, and sell it to other people. Not that. But basically saying, hey, you, you, your life used to be about fish. Now your life is going to be out about making a difference in the lives of other people. And this, this is God's promise. 
It's not like you don't ever look around and see a world that doesn't need help. That's all we see is a world that needs help and people that need help, the people that need the hope and life that God can offer them. That's, you see it everywhere. But I think sometimes we feel inadequate. We feel unworthy, unable to really do anything about it. Like, oh, I can't really do that much. I can only just do, kind of do simple things. I mean, God's just kind of told me to love people. I'm just going to try to love them. I mean, I can, maybe I can, I can give people a little something. Maybe I can just kind of talk. To, I, I can do little things because God says I'm supposed to do these little things. And you start doing the little things because I'm following. He's telling me who I need to be, and I'm believing it, and I'm doing it. And suddenly, He is shaping me into someone. He is shaping me into someone who is is more and can do more and is having, really, it's just making a difference. I'm making a difference in the lives of the people that God has, has put around me. I am helping them know who God is. I'm helping them find the same hope in life that I found. And this is something that He's doing. And we need to make sure that we're clear on this. I mean, this really is, what God is calling you to is, is a complete reshaping of who you are. It begins with this idea of following Jesus that I'm no longer in charge of telling me who I am. I'm no longer in charge of telling me what's right and wrong. Actually, I, I, am, I, am, I am giving all of that to God. That place in my life now completely belongs to God. And so the first thing that he's doing is he's reshaping that priority. God is now the number one priority in my life. He is the one that is directing and guiding me. And then ultimately, he's going to direct and got and that selfishness that we have is just going to get sucked away. And my life is not going to be about me. My not, life is not about going to be about my productivity and my job. My life is going to be about the impact that I can have in the people that God puts around me. This is not a small thing. It, this is a big thing. And all of these objections and all of these fears and all of these things come into their mind. And I can't imagine, again, this, this is four verses that leaves, there's, a, there's, there's some gaps in this story, and we have no idea, it doesn't really tell us what's going on in their mind. I don't know how quickly they made this calculation. I don't know how much they anticipated it. But this is a big decision that they're about to make. Come follow me and I'm going to do this, this, this thing in your life. Well, they, they've got a serious calculation to make. This is all we've ever known. This is all we've ever done. Ever since our dad declared us tall enough and strong enough to be useful, we've been out here doing this every day. This, this is our life. And now here comes Jesus. He says, follow me. But verse 20, at once they left their nets and they followed him. Verse 22, the other set of brothers. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. So the command for them was to follow Jesus. The promise that Jesus made is that he will make them into somebody different that can make a difference. And ultimately their response was to leave it all behind. They left it. They left the fishing boats. They left the sea. They left their dad. They left the nets. They left everything. They left it all behind and followed Jesus. And so the command is the same for you, right? Follow Jesus. It's a little bit different what it looks like. It's less literal, but still the same level of kind of spiritual devotion, this kind of learning and understanding and growing. Right? And the promise is the same. That um, he's going to shape you into somebody that can make a real difference and impact in this world. What about the response? Again, it was a, this was a literal following. And for them to literally follow Jesus, they were going to have to completely and totally live, leave everything that was normal about their lives. They were going to have to leave it behind and start a completely new life essentially on the road with, the, with, with a nomad who was just kind of wandering Israel, telling people about God and who he was as the Savior of the world. So they had to leave their entire life behind. Now again, because you're not having to physically follow Jesus somewhere, the call on your life is not going to look as literal as that, necessarily. Though, 
For some of us, it has been like that. For some of you, it will be like that, where the, where the call on your life is going to be to have a radical change in occupation, to have a radical change in where you, where you are. That, that, that can and does still happen. But honestly, deeper than that, and I want to say more important than that, there's really something else, a series of things that, that, that God is calling us to leave behind. That if I'm going to be someone who follows Jesus, and Jesus is going to remake me into someone who's making a difference in the lives of people around me, what do I need to leave behind? Well, they are leaving their physical lives behind to literally follow Jesus. Let's just say it the same way. That you need to leave your spiritual life behind, your emotional life, your mental life, really just about everything about your life, but you can still stay here and go to work tomorrow. Who I am is now determined by God. Who I'm supposed to be, how I make my decisions, the direction of my life. I have to leave all of that behind, and now I follow Jesus. Jesus tells me who I'm supposed to be and where I'm supposed to go, And I trust Him, and I follow Him. Now, that's a big deal. That's not small. That is not a small thing. Just because you may or may not have to change your job or may not have to move like they did, that's not small. It's still huge. This idea that everything about my life and about who I am and the direction of my life, what my priorities are, who I'm supposed to be, All of that, I have to leave it behind for it to be replaced by who Jesus says I am and who He says I'm supposed to be and giving my life not for myself but for others. That's a big decision. So I've been thinking about these guys and really kind of a radical yes answer that they give to Jesus. I was thinking about them and then I was thinking about me. A 19-year-old, anxious, bitter, weird-feeling freshman in an awkward situation with this dude in the lobby of my dorm. What did, what did we have in common? What was it that about those moments that made us say yes to something that on the, on the surface is like, doesn't seem right? Here's the thing that I knew. I knew that to the degree that I had let Jesus into my life, it had been nothing but a positive for me. When I had let him in this much, I had gotten more than what I'd given in return. I I knew that much. And I also knew that me directing my life, my way, it wasn't working. Every bad situation I had ever found myself in was as a result of my own bad decisions. My life left to my instincts was going nowhere. And to the degree that it was going somewhere, it wasn't somewhere I wanted to go. I knew this much of God in my life was making a huge difference. And I knew where I was headed wasn't working. And my guess is that these two sets of brothers, these these four fishermen, felt the very same way been interacting with Jesus, I've been hearing Him teach, I've been hearing all these things, and it's, it's soothing to my soul. It's bringing me life. I need more of this. And their own sin and their own selfishness had been taking them places where they felt stuck and they felt broken. And they knew that they needed and wanted more. And my guess is, we've probably got a lot in common with them and with 19-year-old me. To the degree that I've really allowed God into my life, it has been a great decision for you. And I know I need more than just a little help. I need to be remade. I need a complete different direction for my life because what this is, is not working. So if that's you, even though it's a a big deal, big, big idea, 
It really is a simple command. It really is a simple application. Your application today is to follow Jesus. And He will do something extraordinary, not simply in your life, but through your life as well and the people around you. But you're going to have to leave it all behind. And you say what, and I don't have to answer that question. Because you have already come up with all sorts of pretty, pretty significant objections in your own head why you would really want to give this level of devotion to Jesus. You've got lots of reasons, lots of objections, lots of fears, lots of control issues, all sorts of things. Concerns about religion and what what kind of per- I don't know what I would be and the fear of, of a loss of control. There's all sorts of things that you're feeling, hearing. And as we move to a time of worship and response, those are the things that we're going to be praying for. That whatever these things are that we feel like are so precious to us that we have to hold on to, that we're going to keep living life in a way that's not working. Whatever those things are. Let's pray for ourselves and pray for each other that we could drop those nets and follow Jesus instead. So as always, I'd encourage you to be back there in our response area. There's people that would love to pray with you. You can take communion. There's prayer candles. You can pray at the cross. We've got an opportunity to worship. We've got an opportunity to give. But let's just let's be there for each other right now. Let's pray and encourage each other that we will get to this next greater step where we can fully say that we are following Jesus so that He can do something incredible in us and pray that we have the courage to leave behind those things that we need to leave. Let's pray. God, I thank You. I thank You for these simple fishermen. God, I do, I thank you that they were as ordinary as it gets. They were not extraordinary people from the way the world saw them. They were regular like us. And you took regular people and made them extraordinary. And so, God, I pray that we would have the courage to follow. The God, that we would trust that you can remake us into something greater. The God, that you would make us into men and women who are really making a difference in this world. And God, whatever fears and objections we have, God, I pray that we would leave them behind and with our whole hearts follow you. And it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen.